Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and our chats with Emily as we're calling our readings through the Johnson edition of the poetry of Emily Dickinson. We turn now to this little poem uh, numbered 113 by Johnson, Our Share of Night to Bear. You can obviously hear all kinds of you know, rhyming happening even in the first line. Now, this is a fascinating little poem. It's another theodicy. That is to say, the question of why must there be pain and suffering in this world? Like, what is that about? Why do we have to go through this terrible tragedy often in life? And, and that can be really frustrating. Certainly for Emily, it can be very frustrating. Now, the last line of the poem is afterwards, day. So in some ways, I'm going to make the argument. It may sound radical at first, that I think a lot of what Emily's doing is often rewriting Dante and her study of the Divine Commedia. In other words, remember what we said about Dante in LearnStrong.net, we've given full lectures of the, of the, of the comedy. Um, remember, it is not that you go to hell ultimately for Dante, but rather that you go through hell. Remember, you've got to get through hell to Purgatorio to finally Paradiso and hurrah. Then there can be some kind of answer to the pain suffering that Dante has experienced, obviously, with the help of Virgil for much of the trip, right? Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already gone through our introductory set of comments where we talked about our big five. You'll remember, what does Emily say about epistemology, what you can know, um, and, and the question of the fallible disposition. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Of course, ontologically, who are we? That's going to be an interesting question in so many of her poems. Of course, psychology, sociology, the study of the individual mind, the study of the collective mind. And then finally, this question of theodicy. Why must there be pain and suffering? Many readers will identify with Emily far better at this level than almost any other level. Like, why must there be pain? Why must there be suffering? And of course, now we're back to Milton and Paradise Lost, no question, right? Now, I want you to notice the brilliant balance of this little poem, okay? When we read it, I'll try and point it out to you. Notice, we'll start with night and end with day. So the balance is quite remarkable in that regards as well. Notice now the balance and the use of the word our four times. Our share of night to bear. Our share of morning. Our blank in bliss to fill. Our blank in scorning. Here a star, there a star. Some lose their way. Here a mist, there a mist. Afterwards, day. Now, I think that Emily is playing some very interesting philosophic games here. She's asking, is it necessary to go through night to get to day? This will be not unlike, of course, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, If Winter Come Can Spring Be Far Behind. The idea of cycles. you got to go through stuff to get to stuff, in other words, right? I go through this to get to that. And I can get through a lot of this if I have a that. If I have a clear that, I can get through this. And Emily's going to play the game with the word share twice and then blank twice. Now my Emily group that I've been working with brilliantly has pointed out that after the word our, you could put the word responsibility, and this poem works rather nicely, our responsibility to share the night to bear, right? Our responsibility uh, to share of mourning. In other words, there is some kind of personal accountability that Emily will play with, even though she uses the collective pronoun of our. Notice, we'll begin with night. We gotta, we gotta go through night, right? That's our share. But then, of course, there's the morning, right? The cyclical understanding. And then there's this interesting phrase, our blank in bliss to fill. This is almost like checking off boxes you might think of. And then our blank in scorning. It's an interesting juxtaposition to go from uh, bliss to scorning, although you can hear all those S sounds, those hard S uh, sibling sounds, which seems to, uh, to, seems to make sense, right? And then notice, after you've got the four hours, we then go to here a star, and there a star. Of course, we're playing around with Odysseus, sailing to try and get back home to Ithaca. That looking up at the star, we're also, of course, back to Sonnet 116 of Shakespeare. It is the star to every wandering bark. The notion that there's going to be momentary stars where you kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. I got it. I'm, I'm figuring this out. Here a star, there a star. And then the interesting line, some lose their way. Now, we said in an earlier poem, Emily loves the word lost. 41 poems will play this game. Here it's not technically lost, but lose. Some lose their way, and I cannot help but think about those opening lines of Dante, the pilgrim, 
in the Divine Commedia, when he says that he, somewhere in the middle of the way, he got lost in a dark wood, and he didn't know where he was anymore. And I think all of us kind of get that feeling, where every once in a while we kind of have this moment of awakening, this epiphany, and we go, how did I get here? How did I get to this moment where I'm unhappy, I'm sad, things aren't working out for me? And it's like, why all of a sudden am I here? And I'm not totally sure how I got here, and I'm really not totally sure how I'm going to get out of here. Some will, in fact, lose their way. You can think of this as obviously Dante's hell, Inferno, no question. And then you have the line, here a mist, and there a mist. Some will say, of course, the mist is that thing, that fog, you can't see very well. Some will interpret mist here as tears. In other words, you've got to go through a lot of tears. And then the final line, afterwards, right? The dash, Emily loves her dash. Day, exclamation point. You can think of day, obviously, as heaven, if you're so inclined, as opposed to, obviously, hell. Well, what are we going to do with a little poem like this at 2A? What's our major message here? I think the argument she's making is that no matter how bad the night is, how long it is, there's always got to be a day that comes. That is to say, this is Emily's attempt to explain the pain and suffering of our life, the Odyssey, and to give some sense of hope. There's got to be some reason why we're going through all of this insanity. I mean, think about you guys. So you're going through this experience of school. It's not easy. It's difficult. It's demanding. It's challenging. Why? What is the point? At the end, obviously, graduation can be the day. We can even, we even call it graduation day. I love it to be, I love the balance. I love the harmony. I love the four hours. And then I love the share and star. I love the blank. All of that works rather nicely, right? Again, at 3A, we mentioned Shelley's wet ode to the west wind. If winter come, can spring be far behind? That is the message he says he wants to share. And, and of course, Dante's Divine Comedia, as we said, that notion that in the end you don't actually go to hell. In the end you go through hell. That's the human experience. That's the meaning of all the pain and the suffering. Finally, at 3B, how are we going to own a little poem like this? Well, what was a time in your life where you did go through a serious amount of pain? And afterwards day, exclamation point. I've had students that actually put the two words afterwards, day, on a piece of paper, and they put it kind of somewhere where they can see it, to be reminded that after all of the night, there has to be the day. I'm hopeful that our study of Emily is helping you to find your way there. Thank you.